Quick question, who's your MPP? Are you sure? Do you even have one? It's been two weeks since the Ontario election, but no one has been sworn in yet. So, are there any MPPs right now? And for that matter, who's governing? Is anyone governing? Such minutia is the delight of Queen's Park watchers and on-poly nerds such as yours truly and Jessica Smith-Cross, the editor-in-chief of QP Briefing and iPolitics, and she joins us now for some answers. Welcome back. Thank you. It's lovely to have you here in the studio. I'm enjoying it myself. Thank you. <laughs> Good. We know that when the lieutenant governor dissolved the last house, there were no more MPPs, right? Everybody's a free agent. But I did get questions. People emailed me questions saying, does that mean Doug Ford's not the premier anymore? So let me ask you, was there ever a time during which Doug Ford was not the premier? No, he stayed the premier and the cabinet stayed the cabinet. If anything major were to happen during the election period, during the caretaker period, they would still be in charge. So if an emergency did come up, you've still got the premier and the cabinet on the job, even though they're campaigning, to make decisions? Yes. Okay, good to know. How much lobbying for cabinet posts has there been since the election on June the 2nd? Well, I can tell you that Doug Ford does not want to hear that. He made that very clear. Do not lobby me. Do not have your people lobby me. It will not help. It might, in fact, hurt. But we do see in the news, you know, people whispering to, to our reporters, to other reporters, you know, I think this person's a shoe in here. Their track record shows that they'd be a great fit for that, that health, minister, health minister spot that needs to be filled. So that's a form of lobbying. I was always told back in the day that if you talked, you didn't know, and if you knew, you didn't talk. Is that still the way? I think that's wise, and we've heard that too from some of the same people who, who talk a little bit. Hmm. Do, um, let's see, the PCs, they won more seats this time than they did last time. 83 now out of 124 seats. That's a serious majority government. Is the scuttlebutt at Queen's Park now as a result of that bigger mandate that they expect this next Ford government to be even more emboldened than, say, the last one was? I, we might see bold. I'm not sure. I don't think we're going to see this sort of wild days after he was first elected where there were a lot of things happening. Some of it was quite messy and quite controversial. This is a different Ford. A diff there are different people surrounding him who I think make better decisions. So we won't see that kind of chaos that marked his earliest days. So he sort of learned the lesson that that kind of disruptive, you know, crazy populism doesn't really work anymore? No, the four that showed up during the pandemic, who was more measured and who was yeah. surrounded by professionals, uh, did better with the population, I think. Now, we had a very unusual election night in as much as I don't think I can ever recall two party leaders resigning on election night together. Uh, Andrew Horvath, Stephen Del Duca, the NDP and Liberal leader, both announced their intention to leave on election night. Does that suggest that Doug Ford is going to have an easier ride certainly in the first year of this new mandate because the two opposition leaders are leaving. You can say that they might be a little bit focused on internal party matters, but there may also be leadership candidates who want to make their mark and they want to do it by taking big old swings at the premier. So we could have a, we could have a very interesting early days for this government. So he shouldn't necessarily think that he's going to have a free reign in the first year or so. No, I think there'll be some, some serious criticism lobbied his way by the people who'd like to lead the opposition parties. Hmm. All right, a new crop of MPPs is going to be sworn in soon. Do they receive, the newbies, do they receive some kind of orientation at Queen's Park to show them where the bathrooms are and the caucus rooms and all this business? They do. 36 of them went to uh, Queen's Park on Wednesday morning to get shown around and understand this place that they're going to be going to. Do you know what kind of pep talk they get? I wasn't privy to that, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish I was. Because I heard that up on Parliament Hill, and, and I, th this again is old news. This, this happened to an MP who told me about it from, say, 20 years ago. They said, look around. By the time your political careers are over, two-thirds of you are going to be divorced. Oh, wow. Because public life can be tough on families. And I just, I, I wonder and I hope that they get the, don't forget about home life. I know, like, because the political career can be pretty intoxicating. Mm -hmm, I don't know if they get that speech. They should get that speech if they don't get that speech. For those MPPs who either lost or did not run again, how much time are they given to sort of clean up their stuff and get out? I asked an MPP who didn't run again, uh, Suze Morrison. She told me she had 10 days from the writ drop to uh, clear out her office space, and she thinks that the, the folks who, didn't, who did win, uh, who, sorry, who did run but didn't win, have a similarly short period of time to get, to get out of Queen's Park. So t t this is 10 days from the time the writs are drawn up? Oh, sorry. I, the, the cardinal <laughs> sin, I think of that every time I, I think of you every time I say that. And you just said it again. I did. That's okay. We'll forgive you one. We always give everybody one. 
Uh, but the, the 10 days has passed, so they should all be gone by now, right? Yes. Theoretically? Okay, good. Now, the budget. We remember the budget was introduced April 28th, but it was never passed because the election writs were drawn up and off to the hustings they went. The conservatives at first said, we are going to reintroduce the exact same budget we introduced when the House comes back. Mm -hmm. That is no longer the plan, is it? That is no longer the plan. Uh, there is an increase to ODSP rates, a small one, uh, that will be... Disability support. Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. Uh, that will be in the reintroduced budget. Uh, the Premier also left some room for other small tweaks that were undefined that we may learn some more about soon. Any guesses at what that might be? I don't know. I think you might want to do something regarding inflation. It's on everybody's mind. If there needs to be an adjustment for other supports because of inflation, that could be something he's thinking about. But I don't know. I haven't actually heard what his, uh, what his planning. That's a closely guarded secret. It's interesting that they spent so much time saying, elect us and we will reintroduce this exact same budget. But then during the campaign, they actually came out with an increased Ontario Disability Support Program plan. Do we know why they did that? Uh, Corey Tanaik, a uh, key advisor to Doug Ford, just said that was a miss. That was something they'd gotten wrong and should have done, and now they're doing it. Hmm. Now, we also know that when the legislature is dissolved, there are oftentimes a bunch of bills on what they call the order paper that did not get passed in time and therefore disappear. It's not to say they can't be called back in the next session. Do we know whether that's the plan, to call back some of those bills that didn't make it last time next time? No, I looked into that, and the, the government did a very good job of getting through its agenda, aside from the budget bill, which is obviously huge. Uh, I know that the NDP has a, a bill that they want to reintroduce, and it's very important to them. That's the Our London Families Act. It's uh, anti-racism measures uh, in honor of the family that was the Muslim family that was killed in London. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of the government's agenda, though, they got everything through they wanted to get through, so they're kind of going in with a clean slate. They are. If there were other opposition bills that got introduced last time but didn't get through, they're certainly entitled to bring them back now, aren't they? They are. And they, prob they probably will, mm -hmm. if they can. Okay. i got to ask you about turnout. Sure. A lot of people have been talking about turnout. 43.5%. Worst ever. I guess a number of us have been asking a lot of different people what interpretation we should draw from such a low turnout. What are you hearing? Everyone I've talked to about this sort of agrees on the same fundamentals that people were just battered by the pandemic, by that tough economic time, inflation. I mean, if you were going on social media halfway through the election, you would see photos of children who'd been killed in the shooting in Texas. There's a lot of bad news going on, scary news going on, not to mention you know, Russia and Ukraine, that it's understandable to me that people would not find Ontario politics the thing that is deserving of their attention right now. I, you know, I live it, but that's not everybody, and I, I can understand that. Right. How about, I mean, I'm going to throw a bunch of different interpretations your way. You tell me if, if you've heard this as well. A lack of confidence in, in politics in general, and maybe in the government in particular, didn't bring a lot of people out. Is that possible? Yeah, I think it was, I'm not... This isn't time my radar. I'm not very angry at the government. I don't need to kick the bums out, excuse the phrase, on public television. <laughs> um, and that's why there was a, a, a small turnout. I'm satisfied enough with them. I heard that, too. I heard a lot of people say, I'm content. It doesn't really matter to me too much about who wins. I'm content with whatever happens. So we shouldn't necessarily interpret it as a complete loss of faith in politics in general. It's just they got bigger fish to fry. Yeah. Yeah, OK. OK, interesting. Uh, are you back at the legislature now? Yes. You're back doing your thing? Yeah. What do you watch? I mean, obviously, nobody's been sworn in yet, so what, what's going on? Why to be back in the building? Yeah. Well, my colleagues are there. We, our office is in the legislature, so we work together. <laughs> and is there anything actually happening down there yet? We're always on the scuttlebutt on the, uh, the leadership elections, so the, the interim leaders and then the leadership elections for the NDP and the Liberals were focused pretty intently on that and wondering who might be in cabinet if, when the cabinet shuffle comes. And are you getting any sense yet about when, I mean, we've got two vacancies coming up for the two main opposition parties. Any mm -hmm. sense about how quickly or not they want to fill those vacancies? No official word yet at all. I think they might take their time. Hmm. What about COVID protocols down at Queen's Park? Uh, we famously remember that one MPP was ushered out of the chamber because she wasn't wearing a mask. Is that still the case? Uh, there's no more screening and there's no more mask mandate. So everybody's okay to come and go as they please now. I don't know if they've changed the uh, the vaccinated the vaccination. Oh, policy. okay, interesting. Yeah. So you might still have to have, yeah. you might still have to be vaccinated to get in there, because that is the case with obviously a lot of other employees elsewhere. Yeah, for MP for MPPs, I don't know yet. Yeah. Hmm. Okay.
Any scuttlebutt about who's going to be the next minister of whatever? Are you hearing anything? Well, the Minister of Health is the most interesting one because right. uh, Christine Elliott has retired. So we've had a little bit of, like we talked about before, people whispering some names who might be good. One of them is uh, Sylvia Jones, who was Solicitor General. But that, that's not a sure thing by any means. I, it's not a sure thing, but I read it in your publication. So it's got to be. I mean, I can take that to the bank if I read it in your newsletter, right? Yep, Charlie Pinkerton got that one. Yeah. <laughs> good, good job, Charlie. That's Jessica Smith-Cross. QP Briefing, iPolitics. We're grateful to have you actually back in our studio again, Jessica. Thanks. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.